Hi everyone, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot and very happy to be here this afternoon. This is John Lear's birthday and we are very, very pleased to have him with us today. And uh, it, it's really great to have him online. So he is on a phone, uh, he's, he, you're not gonna be able to see him, uh, but he is here with us. And John, say hello to everyone. Hello everyone, I'm 76 today and had I known I was gonna live this long, I would have taken much, much better care of myself. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Now, uh, you have been really instrumental in this whole UFO story and folding it, help to, helping to reveal the truth behind the scenes in so many ways. And we are all so grateful to you for, for being with us all this time and for sharing your knowledge and doing your investigations and all of that and sharing it with Project Camelot, of course, all those years ago. And we have some wonderful interviews with you, um, even coming up to the very recent future here or past, and um, including tonight. And so today is your birthday. Uh, you say Bob Lazar may be in town. He may show up at your birthday, but it might be a surprise you don't know. Um, so we saw Bob Lazar uh, in Los Angeles for the premiere of a documentary uh, and it is made by uh, Jeremy Corbell and Bob Lazar was there in person with George Knapp, who I assume might be at your birthday as well. And so I just, just want to say uh, happy birthday, John, for me and a lot of love from everybody. And I know people are in the chat right now. We have a live show and I, I'm hoping the, the audio is going over well and, and people will know that it is, uh, it is your birthday. So it's a very special time to be able to actually contact you before the festivities, I guess, really begin at your end and you're too busy to talk to us. So this is, uh, this is kind of a historic moment because there was a huge crowd that did come down to watch the movie last night and support Bob Lazar. And uh, they gave him a standing ovation uh, actually a couple times. And he is uh, considered a, really a hero for having revealed the truth he was at liberty to disclose to some degree. And we know there's a lot of secrets still being held back. Now, uh, what we want to do is we want to really talk to you about, first of all, back in the day, Project Camelot, you shared what Bob told you when he was going through his employee, you know, at S4, at what some people call Groom Lake, Area 51, and you had many experiences with him, and uh, sounds like he was kind of stopping by your house quite often, et cetera. So, and you've also given me some very interesting drawings he made uh, during that time. And so why don't you, let's go back in time and talk about what really went on during those days uh, when Bob Lazar was working for S4 and, uh, and what happened the day that he came, you can tell the story again, if you don't mind, about how he, he actually saw an alien. Yeah, um, he would come to my house <clears throat> always right after he got back from S4 and uh, tell me as much as he can. And the, the first time uh, he came, uh, the first time he w was up at uh, Groom Lake and S4, and he, he said uh, he was sitting in front of my desk and I was just doing my regular desk work. And, and he said, I saw this today. And I said, what? said, I saw a disc today. And I said, theirs or ours? He said, theirs. I said, you went to Groom Lake? He said, yeah. Uh, I said, well, then what are you doing here? Obviously, they followed you, Bob. Why don't you work up there for a couple of months, find out what's going on, and then tell us, you know, they're, they're going to, um, they know that you they followed you up here, and they're going to put the stop to this. And he says, no. And he says, I'll tell you what. He says, I've seen you take so much crap over the last six months. And uh, he said, I wanted to tell you, it's true. I saw it. I touched it. I was in it. And it's all true. And uh, so he said, I'm willing to go that far. And unbeknownst to Bob and us, the whole thing was a setup by MJ1. Uh, my 
McClellan. Uh, they had picked, they wanted to get the information out, but they wanted a way to be able to backpedal, to get out of it in case it turned sour. They wanted to find out how the public would react to this uh, information. So what they did is they picked Bob Lazar, who was extremely intelligent, had degrees all over the place, one from MIT, one from Caltech, and I know, I know, I can't support it, but in fact, I saw those uh, degrees, and they disappeared from my house. But anyway, they picked him because he's extremely intelligent, and he also did a lot of other things uh, that would make him easy to discredit. For instance, uh, at one point in his career, he ran a cat house up in Reno uh, called the Honeysuckle Ranch. And uh, he did a lot of other things, and they could use him, and he could contribute. As a matter of fact, his main contribution up at S4 was he told them what that little triangle was, 115. That was his contribution. They didn't know what it was until he was able to count the protons and figure out his 115. Now, uh, there's been stories of we've been able to duplicate it. Is totally untrue. There is absolutely no way that we could duplicate the 115 that uh, that he saw and had, and we had a couple of samples of. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, he'd come to my house and and tell me the different things that go on. Now, in January or February of 1989, uh, I remember it was very cold, and he came in, sat down. And he was obviously excited. He had something to tell me. Now, we knew that everything was being recorded. We knew that they had some uh, recording device in the house. We knew all the phones were tapped. And he didn't want to really say what he had to tell me in my den. So he gave me the high sign, and we went out my den door. We walked along uh, the side of the pool out to the back where the stables are, and there's this big giant wood gate, and uh, Merrily happened to be back there uh, coming out of the guest house, and she's always suspicious of what we're doing. She says, where are you guys going? <laughs> so we said, oh, we're just going out to the stables. We'll be right back. So um, we walked to this big wooden gate door, and hold on just a second, Allie. Um, walked to that wooden gate and uh, closed it and he just in the corner he backed into it he said and he looked at me I said what 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 and he said John you'll never know what it's like to see your first alien I said you saw one yep I said are you sure it could have been a doll could it no no, it was a gray. And then he told me the story about how he'd been escorted down this hallway with a guard on each side. And they were walking by a door, uh, which had a window in it that uh, had some wires running through it. And he could see through this window uh, a gray with uh, facing away from him and facing uh, two lab-coated, white lab-coated scientists facing towards Spot. And uh, it was that is that is what he saw. Uh, now, <clears throat> ever since he told me that, he's denied it, and that's okay because I can understand it. First of all, it's tough enough to be able to tell the world that you worked on extraterrestrial craft and have them believe that. But to tell him you saw a live alien, no, it's not going to work. People are not going to believe it, and they're obviously going to think you're crazy. Right. So I understand that. But, uh, you know, I'll tell you the story. I just told you the story is exactly what happened, exactly how he saw the alien. And that wasn't the only time, you know, that there was an experience when he was being briefed on the level of security. There was an alien behind a, a sheeted uh, uh, wall that was monitoring what was going on. And there's several instances uh, when he had that uh, or saw a or 
known of the presence of a gray. The third time was <clears throat> when he was reading the uh, briefings. They would give him uh, about 150 different briefings uh, on a table, and he was allowed to go through these briefings for, you know, about an hour or half hour, 45 minutes. Uh, and uh, when George Knapp uh, arranged for the lie detector test with uh, Tabernetti, um, uh, Gene Hunt was with Bob, and they go to whatever hotel or wherever they were going to do the recording. And uh, there was a few minutes when uh, nobody had showed up, and they were just sitting there waiting. And uh, all of a sudden, Gene, who we call Goof on, uh, looked at Bob, and Bob had turned completely white, and it looked like he was going to pass out. And he said, what? Hey, what's the matter, Bob? And Bob said, uh, I just had a total uh, recall of reading those uh, briefings. And there was a gray sitting across from me. And uh, he said it was really, it was really something. I almost passed out. Uh, but that was remembering the third time he had seen an alien. But Wow, <clears throat> that's incredible. You know, uh, there is also a part in our interview where you actually say that one that after that, sometime after that, uh, Bob came by and said he'd actually gone on. Uh, I, I don't I forget the name of the, the, the plane, but he just he went for the whole day, he came back and his mind had been wiped. He, he said and he basically said he wanted to quit because of it. Do you remember that? Yeah, that was the. The day after the third time we were all caught up at the test site and uh, t told to get out of there. The next morning, Bob got a call from, uh, um, what was the guy's name? Uh, right. Do you remember it? Uh, no, I don't. But a guy that, yeah, th that was sort of in charge of him. Anyway, his boss called him and said, Bob, don't go to the airport today. I'm going to pick you up. And uh, we're going to drive... Uh, we're going to go somewhere. So uh, the guy came by, uh, picked up Bob, and, and this was his superior. And I, if I remember correctly, I think they took Bob's Corvette, but uh, I'm not sure which car they went in. But they drove up to Indian Springs uh, Auxiliary Air Force Base, which is now Creech Air Force Base. And uh, that's a uh, Air Force Base that's about... Oh, about 30 minutes north west of uh, Las Vegas. And they use all, that's where they, now they use uh, all the uh, drones are all based out of there. Oh, but wow. it's the central headquarters for all of the security for the Nevada NS site, now called the Nevada Security something. Anyway, uh, they drive in there and... <clears throat> Uh, they stop in front of the the building where the security headquarters was, and uh, somebody came out and opened Bob's door and put a gun up to his head and said, "Bob, you need to come this way." And they took him in into this building, and uh, there was a couple people there. They sat him down in front of his desk, and they said. Now, Bob, when we gave you this security clearance, it didn't mean you were supposed to take all of your friends <laughs> up to the test site and show them the flying toddlers. Now, do you want to work here or not? And uh, he was not committal. He didn't say yes or no. They started harassing him, and they had brought the guards that had caught us, or not caught us, but stopped us up at the... Uh, up at that uh, dirt road that leads into Groom Lake. And uh, there was, uh, when they got to the car, Bob had already gone out to hide in the desert. And uh, uh, so they said, what are you people doing here? And I said that, you know, uh, well, we thought we had interrupted some kind of drug transaction. And he said, no, 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 no drug transaction. Uh, we need to know what you guys were doing here. And said, well, I just looked at the stars. And they said, well, then why were you trying to get away from us? 
And of course, we didn't have an answer to that. But he said, we need to see a driver's license and uh, get some information from you. So over the next half hour, they uh, there was, see, there was me and Gene Huff and Bob's wife, Tracy, and her sister. And uh, <clears throat> so we gave him social security number, driver's license, and it went on for about a half an hour. And um, uh, they said, okay, now what we want you to do is you have every right to be on this land. It's BLM land, it's not restricted. But if you do, I can guarantee you, we're gonna make it very, very uncomfortable for you. So you need to be on your way. So they get in their car and they turn around and leave. I think there were two cars there and uh, go down the road. It was very, very dark there. I mean, it was just, there weren't any lights except the vehicle lights and and uh, we couldn't see exactly what they were doing. But anyway, about 10 minutes later, Bob comes out of the desert and he had had his nine millimeter uh, handgun with him <clears throat> and uh, he regaled us with his story. <laughs> And he says, I had him right in my sights. And he said, boy, if that ever made one move towards me, he said, I would have pulled the trigger and all this. And, of course, unbeknownst to us, the security guys had just gone down maybe 100 yards uh, away down this road. And they had they were filming us uh, and they had a parabolic microphone and recording everything that we said. <laughs> So anyway, uh, we talked for about 15 minutes and then uh, we uh, uh, got back in the car and uh, and uh, it was only another mile or two to the uh, 375 and, uh, and the highway. And so we drove down there and just as we got to the, the paved road, uh the sirens start and red lights and uh the uh highway patrol have been waiting for us and uh they pulled us over and uh usual you know the usual stuff out of the car get your hands up everybody face the car put your hands on top of the on top of the rope and da 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 so we all did that and <clears throat> and uh the guy's name was, I thought I'd never forget it. He was a, he was the head, and I'm not sure what the like Lincoln County Sheriff. And uh, so he was the one that always they called, called out there whenever they had problems. So we kind of knew the guy anyway. And, and uh, so he uh, is in contact with the security at Groom Lake. And of course, we can't hear that conversation, but uh, he says, okay, now look at, he says, I want to know two things. He said, I want to know why there are five people in this car now, and there was only four when security stopped you a half an hour ago on the road. And he said, the second thing I want to know is where the 45 is. And uh, we put the 45 in the, in the, uh, in the trunk. <clears throat> so we hemmed and hawed and nobody gave an answer of this or that. And, uh, and, um, uh, pretty soon, uh, it was either just before we made that statement or after, but he said, uh, okay, I'm not going to see, I'm going to need to see everybody's driver's license and like a complete idiot. <laughs> And Bob has never forgiven me for this. <laughs> I said, mine's in the trunk. <laughs> Which is where we had the gun and then and all the guy your cat and everything else. And uh, to this day, he's never forgiven me for that. But anyway, we did not open the trunk. We just hemmed and hawed and, and, uh, this guy, I don't remember his name in a second, kept saying, you know, all I have to do is get uh, a court order and I can get this vehicle towed and we can find the 45 and uh, put you all in jail. 
And all of this went on for like about an hour. And he was always talking to the security people. We don't know what he was saying. But we hemmed in hot and nobody gave anything, no, no information at all. So after about, I think it was pretty close to an hour, he says, um, okay, now here's the deal. He said, I don't know why I'm being told this, but they're telling me to let you go and tell you never to come back here again. So you need to get in the car and leave right now, which we did. And everybody got in the car. And uh, we, I remember that long drive home where we discussed what Bob was going to use for an excuse to having been out there. And uh, so the next day when Dennis Mariana uh, picked him up and took him up to uh, uh, Indian Springs uh, and they started debriefing him and saying, you know, Bob, when we gave you this clearance, it didn't mean that you were supposed to tell, take all of your friends up there and show them the blind soldiers. And they had two of the guys that had stopped us. And apparently they didn't know anything about the blind soldiers because Bob said they had a shocked look on their face when the guy said flying soldiers. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's that's like awesome. Uh, so okay, so you're saying though that that it's sort of the crunch came after during that time and after it when Bob basically took that flight uh, one day and then he came. Okay, back. let me finish now. Uh, let me yeah. finish. Okay, go ahead. Now, so um, they said. Then they said, um, now there's a problem, Bob, and. Uh, and uh, we've discovered that uh, your wife is having an affair with her flight instructor and you can't work with us until you get that sorted out because we don't want anybody with uh, the emotional kinds of problems uh, that can happen with these kind of things. So you're going to have to get that sorted out um, before you come back to work. So then um, Bob leaves. And uh, Mariana drives him back. And I talked to Bob either that day or the next day. And I asked him, you know, if uh, he was going to go back, if he got his problem sorted out. And he said, no. And I said, why not? He said, because the last two flights that I made in the 737 up to Groom Lake, he said, I could remember climbing up the steps to board the airplane in the morning. And I could remember coming back down those steps in the evening, but I couldn't remember anything I did. And they have a way of, of uh, uh, controlling your mind so that you remember, you can't remember what you did. Now, they used to be able to do this many years prior to that. Now, I, I personally have known people that have uh, worked up there and told it, but uh, many years prior, like 20, 30 years prior, they could do the same thing. But the problem was people could remember uh, that they had done something and it bothered them. And they had um, problems trying to remember what they did. Whereas in this case, Bob said, you know, it didn't bother him at all. I just remembered uh, that, uh, uh, that he had done something, but it didn't create a problem other than the fact that he didn't want to work like that. So that's when he told me that uh, he would not have gone back had they offered it. Okay. Now, do you think, you know, because I told you, you haven't seen this film yet that came out, uh, you know, the Jeremy Corbyn one, right? Right. Okay. But some people have reported various things to you. Uh, and I called you because I wanted to to warn you that in the film, it appears that Bob Lazard no longer remembers that he saw a real alien. <laughs> he never did remember uh, from the first day, you know, the next day or the next week, whenever it was, whenever people would ask him that story, he said, uh, he would say, no, no, no. I, you know, they showed, there was a window and I looked through it. But it was obviously a doll, and they were just they were just doing some kind of mind game. And John has made this all up. Uh, I told him the story, and John said that was an alien. You saw an alien, and uh, 
John's just making that stuff up. And that's been his story all along. But I can understand that, and I can understand why he said that. But the, night, the, the story I just told you a few minutes ago is exactly the way it happened. Right. Okay, and then you've also elaborated that he's actually seen more than one. Now, uh, it, I'm very curious. There's two questions that never got asked during the uh, interviews with him, and I think it's quite astonishing. One is whether he ever rode in the craft because he was supposed to be working on it so much, number one. And number two is uh, whether or not some of that missing time, whether he, he felt that he'd ever been, you know, abducted, uh, messed with, uh, in, you know, and de and had those memories mo wiped. Wouldn't that be a normal thing to wonder? You know, um, I don't believe he ever went in the craft. Uh, it's possible he did, but I don't think they did that. I think only the guy that was flying it was the guy that was allowed to to uh, ride in the craft. Meaning, I don't think they would the risk alien. having us. I don't think they would risk having us behind us uh, going the craft. As far as being abducted, are you talking about his prior life? No, I mean, the prior life is a perfect, you know, is perfectly fair game for abduction, as you know, and you must know something about the Greys at this point, to this degree, that we know that the abductions are, are still going on. They're rampant, and they've been rampant for all those years. Uh, but the question is, you know, as a scientist, uh, having his mind wiped, it's very logical that maybe he was even chosen because he, he was having interactions with Grace and maybe he didn't know it. Okay, so what's the question? The question is whether or not uh, you ever talked to him as a friend about whether he'd been abducted. I, I may have, but I don't, I don't ever remember talking about talking to him about whether he'd been abducted. In those days, um, I think I was still under the impression that there was only a few people that they abducted. I think it was like we we thought that it was one in ten. But since then, you know, I've found out that they abduct everybody. Everybody. I and mean, everybody is abducted at least uh, five or ten times during their lifetime. And that's just the way it goes. But so I'm sure that uh, he would have been abducted, but I never talked to him about it because in those days I thought it was like one in ten that they abducted. Okay. Well, uh, you know Bob's wife, right? Pardon? You know Bob's wife. I don't know her name, but his wife. Crazy. She, yeah, she's in the in the film a, a few times. And uh, have you ever talked to her about whether, you know, I have you guys sat around and talked about abduction since then? You know, you're, you've been friends with him now for, I don't know, over 60 years probably or maybe more. Uh, no, I never talked to her about it. Um, we weren't that close. And, you know, when I when all this was going on, um, for some reason, she wasn't around very much. The only uh, action I had with her was when Bob first was trying to, he didn't know exactly where S4 was. We thought it was to the north. And uh, she and I, I rented an airplane and we flew up north of Groom Lake and we were looking along the ridge, the uh, western ridge of Bald Mountain for this facility. But uh, but uh, we didn't see anything, and it was only like a week or two later that we found out it was to the south uh, along Papoose uh, Lake that this, uh, this facility was. All right. So you think he was selected for the program in general? You mean you think that the military had in mind to actually... Uh, let him kind of be a whistleblower at a certain point? Absolutely, positively. That was Mike McClellan's idea. He was MJ1, and I've been told that that was his idea. Uh, they wanted to get the information out, but they also wanted to be able to get themselves out of a fix if the public reacted, uh, 
if the public reaction was something that they, uh, they didn't like. So the way they could do that is get somebody who was extremely uh, qualified for that position, but be able to discredit him instantly in case things turn sour. So, yes, it was, it was all planned from the beginning, and they knew that Bob Lazar would instantly tell me what was going on, and they knew that I would blab the whole story. And that was that was the uh, the way they had it planned. <laughs> That's the way it worked out. <laughs> right. Okay. Now, why? Tell me something. Why were you not interviewed for this film? Which film? This new documentary with James uh, that uh, Jeremy Corbell Bell has uh, oh, has put out. I don't know. You know, Jeremy. Uh, a lot of the stuff that's in that movie came out of my den. Jeremy interviewed me for two or three years for the uh, the movie he was going to make on me, and and he had access to my videotapes, my stories about Bob, and uh, my memorabilia, drawings and stuff. So I've seen the trailer, and I've seen my stuff in there. Uh, nobody's asked me permission, and after all, we're we're for getting the information out, so. I can't say too much about it. I can't object to it because he did get the information out. So, okay. as, so to, uh, as to why they, as to why they didn't put me in, I'm not the subject. Bob was the subject. All right. Uh, so let me ask you this because you know, last night Bob Lazar was on stage with Jeremy, the the director, as well as George Knapp. And uh, someone asked him, you know, what he was referring to when he said he saw the, the alien cadavers. Apparently he saw pictures of an alien cadaver. And that was part of the briefing report. They clarified that piece of information. But what they didn't do is talk about ha his having seen an alien. And obviously, if, if you're saying Corbell had access to your information, he decided not to use your side of that story. Uh, about Bob having seen an alien, correct? Um, you know, I don't remember discussing that. I must have. <laughs> Over the two years, three years he was up here, I'm sure I told him that story a million times. Uh, but right. I don't know why they used it. I, they didn't I do use, know did, that they did not use it. That, uh, uh, Corbell was looking for some kind of new information because everybody wanted you know, those of us that have known Bob for 30 years wanted to know, wanted this to be the Lazar tape too. You know, we was gonna divulge more stuff, but Bob's told just about, I mean, everything that ever happened to him. There All right, is well, else. let me ask you something because in the film, he has this thing that supposedly was relatively new, at least to many in the audience, even old timers, uh, having to do with using his hand to access uh, the doors, to get inside the facility and so on. Uh, and that it was some kind of, um, I don't know if you call it biometric or what it is, but he he showed a picture. Apparently Jeremy had found a picture of this machine they used back in those days that matched Bob's description of how you had to put your hand up and it had to fit and it read something about your hand. Do you remember that story? Yeah, it measured two bones in your hand when you put your hand on this machine, there's two bones uh, inside your hand that are different for every single human being. And that's how they can identify you other than, you know, the eyeball recognition and facial recognition and all that. Um, this was just another way to be sure uh, that you were who you were supposed to be and it had to do with these two bones in your hand. All right. So you you had have you seen a picture of the device, uh, or did Jeremy show you the photo he found, or had Bob? No, I've never heard of it. Oh, really? Okay, that's interesting. No. All right. So now there, you sent me some uh, drawings that Bob made. One of them is obviously of the alien uh, with the two guys standing over him, as, as seen through that little window which is that he did describe that scene. He just later didn't say that little being was a gray. He 
I originally said it was a gray, but then uh, he, he apparently now is saying it might have been a doll. Is that correct? So, yeah, yeah, those are, you know, when he first told me the story, uh, it go deep out in the backyard. And then when we came inside, um, he, we had, I had a piece of paper there and asked him different questions. And you can see on the piece of paper that he has up on the top right hand side or the left hand side is the dimensions of the hangers, which was 360 feet. And, uh, each one was about 40 feet in dimension. And, uh, <clears throat> at the bottom, there's, uh, a drawing of uh, how the UFO fit in the hangar and up to the uh, right hand side of the top is a drawing of the test site and how where uh, Area 51 was and where Papoose Lake was and uh, on the other side of that piece of paper uh, is the drawing of um, the uh, Aurora which he saw several times uh, at Groom Lake when he got out of the uh, 737, uh, and he said it was parked uh, a little ways away, and he could only see it from the back. So the drawing that I posted many times on the web is the the view that what he saw from the back, and it was a gigantic um, two squares for the exhaust for the whatever engine it was. Um, he said you could easily put a full-size automobile in it or more or bigger than that. And uh, he's described it as a, as a shape of a X-15, but much, much larger. Okay, and now I that Aurora, was, is that one of ours? Is that one of ours? Aurora? Yeah, did we design it? Was it designed by yeah. Lockheed or whatever? Yeah, that was the one that that uh, they denied never made, but they made seven of them. Two of them crashed. One of them crashed at Bald Mountain on takeoff uh, just north of the group. But uh, you talk to people associated with the program and they completely deny it and said, oh, no, no, that was what they called, that was the name for the B-1 when they were, or the B-2 when they were uh, initially designing it. But that's all BS. I mean, there was... There's many more, or not many, but there's a lot more aircraft. You know, some people think that Lockheed Skunk Works is the only one to have made secret airplane, but there's at least uh, three other aircraft manufacturers that make secret airplanes that, that we have no idea. Uh, and I do. I have seen, I've, I've heard about other airplanes, but, uh, and just recently there's one that uh, Crow 77. Crow 777 has uh, posted the videos uh, of, and it has three engines, uh, and it's at least at an altitude of two or 300,000 feet. And I think it's an amazing video. Nobody talks about it, but, but you know, we do have those craft, and, uh, Very cool. and they, they are there. So uh, Lockheed isn't the only one. Absolutely. That, uh, well, now, uh, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, did Bob Lazar ever uh, meet um, Ben Rich? I never heard of him meeting Ben Rich. Okay. Now, if you know my story of, uh, have you been reading my Facebook pages? When I can, but sometimes you're doing a lot. I, I might have missed something. Okay, well, about six months ago, I wrote a story of the F-117A, the history of the F-117A, and how it was run, uh, Air Force Systems Command, Brigadier, uh, Lieutenant General Bobby Bonds ran the program. And uh, when Ben Rich's book came out called The Skunk Works, he let out a few hints that led me to the story of the F-19. The F-19, they made 64 of them. It went down the assembly line uh, next to the F-117A, but was hidden by a large metal curtain. And nobody from one program was allowed to work on the other program. And uh, those F-19s were a uh, batwing uh, stealth fighter 
more advanced than the F-117A, they made 64 of them, and I believe that most of them uh, went to Israel. And it turns out that Ben Rich uh, was the highest ranking Mossad spy west of Mississippi, and he had access to just about every secret we had, uh, not only at, uh, within the aircraft uh, business, but uh, other, too, other businesses too. And what's okay. interesting, um, Terry, is that two weeks ago, I went to Daryl Greenemeyer's Celebration of Life in Indio. Uh, and of course, Daryl Greenemeyer was the fifth guy to fly the back bird, and he and I have been friends for 40 years. Well, uh, I was sitting at a banquet table with Marilee uh, at the door of the banquet and before everybody had come in and and two guys came in and uh, uh one was adam robbins who uh, was helped me and uh, daryl put on the uh, mojave california 1000 in 1970. the other person i won't name but he came over i had known him for 40 years he shook my hand and he said john there's a few of us that thank you for writing about our secrets <laughs> and uh, they that told me that what I put was true that uh, essentially uh, Israel has taken over not only our country but Lockheed in total and they had one of the highest ranking Mossad spies head of the skunk works and uh, of course the guys that work there they're not they they're bound by their security clearances and even though they don't work there anymore and they've retired, they can't say anything about it. And so when he said, we want to thank you for publishing our secrets, it gave me a high <laughs> that lasted for about a week. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Now there's a story that you started to tell, uh, actually before we got live on the phone and, uh, you were talking about a promise that Bob made that he said he was something about he was going to kill himself and how he had to renege on that promise. Can you tell that story? Yeah, it was when I started talking about the moon and uh, the the buildings up there, and I was becoming aware of uh, all the stuff that was going on on the moon and and the humans that lived up there. And uh, as a matter of fact, I just saw a post that Stephen Bassett made. I don't know who Bassett is, but he said you could take it to the banks at Lear's Wrong to earn 250,000 people that live on the moon. Um, and he's right. I was wrong. There's 2 billion people uh, live up there. Uh, and all I have to do is look at Bruce Schwartz's videos. So right. I don't know what Stephen Bassett is using for information. Exactly. But whatever he's got is wrong. But anyway, I was on to this uh, about the time I met Bob. And I was showing some of the pictures that uh, showed the stuff. So uh, when we, when I walked out this particular day of his house, uh, he said, you know, John, he said, if any of this stuff turns out to be true about this moon stuff that you're talking about, I'm going to have to kill myself. Because, of course, Bob can't stand that I know anything that he doesn't. So uh, I said, well, wait just a minute. And I had a little piece of paper and I put on it. Uh, I have it here. I have the original piece of paper. And it says, uh, I, Bob Lazar, promise to kill myself if any of John's moon stuff is true. So I did Bob Lazar, August 23rd, uh, 1996. So... Of course, a couple of years goes by and I started ordering photos from uh, the NASA contractor and by some colossal, of course, there is no such thing as a cause coincidence. So <laughs> I'll just say uh, somebody sent me, I ordered one of the Copernicus pictures that's taken at an oblique angle. And I think it's Lunar Orbiter 2, 163 or 162. But anyway, when it came, it came as a 15 by 20 negative. And this is just absolutely unbelievable that somebody would be sent something that big. Usually you get, you know, an AeroPress version that's, <clears throat> that's an 8 by 10 positive. But anyway, it was so large that in those days, uh, Las Vegas didn't have the capability of printing a 15 by 20 negative. So I had to wait a couple of years 
before the technology got to where I could get a print. So when I finally did, I had a 15 by 20 print of this Copernicus picture, and it showed, you know, all kinds of stuff. It showed uh, buildings, and it showed um, uh, vapor coming up from these uh, huge cylindrical tanks, and uh, all kinds of things on it. But anyway, I took it over to Bob's and showed him and showed him the one building uh, that we call the parking garage, and uh, because it was it had to be several hundred feet tall and had a ramp on the side. So he says, well, yeah, there's no doubt about it. That That is that is something that shouldn't be there. And I said, okay, now, Bob, you know, <laughs> we've been friends a long time, and I don't want to presume on our friendship, but you did promise to kill yourself if any of my mood stuff was true. And he says, well, how can I get out of it? And I said, well, let me run something. And then you sign it. So I'm reading from here. It says um, August uh, August third, nineteen ninety eight. Hi, Bob Lazar. In return for not having to honor my commitment to kill myself, if any of John's moon stuff was true, do freely admit that the object on the crater Copernicus on the moon, uh, saved as apple crate, is a box which I don't know what is doing there. So I'm Bob Lazar. Now, we saved it as apple crate because even though it's a building, Bob is not going to put building, he's going to put, <laughs> put apple crate. And so I had those two pieces of paper and I posted them on the web and, and uh, you know, I try to get him to sign stuff sometimes when when he doesn't believe me, and then it turns out I'm true. But as far as the um, as far as the uh, alien thing, I visited him in in 2003. I had delivered uh, Lockheed L-1011 TriStar to Roswell, and Bob had invited me to Albuquerque to see him, and I took a bus from Roswell to Albuquerque and he picked me up at the bus station and I stayed with him for a couple of days. But during those couple of days, we'd go out in the garage and do whatever we did. Bob was working on different stuff. And that's when he gave me the uh, half scale version of the antimatter reactor, which is now uh, in my, in my den in a glass case. And it's probably the greatest thing he ever gave me. But anyway, on one of these uh, days, we're talking, and I said, now, Bob, you know, you're always denying this uh, this uh, story about the alien that you told me. And uh, uh, he said, you know, I do remember. I remember it. And I remember telling you that. So I got a piece of paper, and I wrote down <laughs> John. I remember. Bob was our... August 14th, 2003, but I couldn't get him to sign it. <laughs> but at least I got the piece of paper and I, it reminded, you know, reminds me that that uh, he did admit it. And I don't need him to admit it. I know what he said. Uh, yeah. And I don't blame him for not admitting it because people would just think he's stupid. There's, uh, well, there's and some more. Yeah, this is a different time now, you know, and everyone, uh, I mean, like I said, he got standing ovations uh, last night and for showing up and, and he didn't stay very long or answer many questions. In fact, they wouldn't even let the audience talk to him. Uh, they insisted people, someone was able to send Twitter questions apparently, but uh, they really had him kind of on lockdown. Uh, now, how do you know, I mean, do you have any idea how he was convinced after all these years of saying he wouldn't do such a thing that he was uh, convinced to, to actually participate in a documentary? You know, I don't know. Um, uh, Jeremy has a way of ingratiating himself to people. I know he did to me and, and, uh, I don't think Bob said very much uh, different than what he's been saying now. Right. But uh, it's certainly a good 
uh, a good thing for people who did not know that much about Bible's art. Uh, it would be great for them, this uh, video, but for the people who have known about Bob for the last 30 years, they wanted more information, you know, come on, tell us the rest of the story. <laughs> You know, and there was no more rest of the story. He's told everything there was. And I think uh, him, somebody told me that uh, Jeremy alludes to secret information about 115, but there is no more secret information about 115. Uh, he, the, the one thing that they don't say uh, that I know is Bob was the one that figured out it was element 115. Okay. Now, got there, and that was just a contribution to S4. Right, and you did say that earlier today. So uh, now there, there is a question about the end of the film. Uh, they they make it sound as though Bob is going to tell some big secret, and then they so, <laughs> and then nothing happens, and then he gets his house broken into, and they make a big thing about the FBI searching the house for this element. 115 saying that oh maybe he secreted away a piece of it after all these years suddenly they're going to search his house which sounds kind of ludicrous but it's all bullshit that may carry yeah. that's all bullshit the, the fbi was there whoever it was uh they were interested in the stuff that he supposedly stored there and uh, uh it was actually uh the dea that gave him the stuff to store and uh, <laughs> when the FBI found that stuff, and I forget what chemical it was, they said, what do you think the DEA would think if we told them it was there? And he said, why don't you ask them? They're the ones that put it there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that just but sounds it just... nothing to do with 115. All I right. Well, you know what? Thing. He also says all kinds of agency people were there searching his house. But, you know, it's really interesting to me. He never once mentions the CIA which makes me think that the CIA are the ones that put this guy, Jeremy Corbell, up to this uh, whole making this documentary and that he and Knapp and all these guys got together and decided he was an airtight disclosure witness that suddenly Bob Lazar's story could be told to the public. And so now they're trotting him out and he's, he's basically going along with it because why shouldn't he? He wants to be vindicated after all these years, right? Okay, so what's what's your statement? Well, my statement is simply that it's very interesting when he started naming agencies that supposedly yeah. were surveilling him or, you know, looking at stuff in his yeah. house. He never once mentioned the CIA. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah. that's to me, I, that's a big oversight. You know, I, uh, certainly, I can say, Terry, it had nothing to do with 115 or any of his work. I, all right. I think they want to, I think they want to, or Jeremy or whoever wants to say that there's some big secret and they're going to find it out. It's not true. All right. Well, what, well, you know, you've heard about the idea of, of people in our business, so to speak, having a get out of jail free card, right? right. And, and putting something hidden, hiding something. I mean, I'm sure Gary McKinnon did it. Uh, you know, you could name everybody that you or I know who might know anything about this sector wouldn't there be a good reason for Bob to, to have what you call a get out of jail free card? Is that what they're looking for? Well, I don't think he has one, but, uh, right. you know, I don't know. Uh, well, let, let me ask you something. Do you have one? No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. But, uh, the only guy I knew that really had a get out of jail free card was a guy named Farhad Azima, and he was an Iranian that ran one of the airlines I worked for, Global uh, International. And uh, we did all kinds of stuff that uh, that uh, he had to have had a get out of jail free card. And uh, one thing he did is he uh, was a veteran gambler, and he used to gamble to dunes. And uh, when I first applied for a job at Global Airlines, the chief pilot took an immediately disliking to me. And uh, he said, no, I, 
we don't need you. And, and I was fully qualified. I had Boeing 707 time, command time out the kazoo, and he just didn't like me, and I wasn't going to get a job there. So mm-hmm. uh, I had a friend that worked in operations there, and he called me one day, and he said, you know, Farhad's out there in Vegas at the dunes. And I said, oh, cool. So I happened to know the casino manager at the dunes, and I went out there, and, and uh I forget his name. He said, what's going on, John? I said, you know, I'm trying to get a job with Global, and I just can't get by the cheap pilot. I wonder if you could help me. He says, absolutely. Give me 10 minutes. <laughs> so he disappears out of the office, comes back 10 minutes later, says, come on, I want you to meet Farhad. So we go out into the crab table, and Farhad's sitting there, and he reaches out to shake my hand. He says, John, it's a pleasure to meet you, and uh, it's nice to have you as an employee of Global International Airlines, and um, ground school starts next Monday. So I was absolutely shocked, and uh, I talked to him for a few minutes and then walked back into the casino manager's office, and uh, I said, how in the heck did you do that? And he said, well, Farhad owes his four million dollars and we gave him two million <laughs> off if he'd hire you wow i said well thanks i appreciate that <laughs> that's incredible well why were they so motivated anyway, to have you work for global pardon why were they so motivated to have you work for global who? i don't know the guy who you said got you the job like oh no he was just friends he was just friends, and they knew they weren't going to get the $4 million out of Farhad, so the best they could do was get me a job. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Now, That's all I, they got. I want to ask you something else, uh, and I, I, have a, I have a chat room along with the show, and I know you've got a party that's going to be starting soon, so we don't want to keep you too long. Uh, but yeah, I got it. you guys had uh, – you remember the shootings in Vegas, right? You were there at the time. The what? The shootings, you know, the shootings you had. Yeah. The casino. Yeah. Well, uh, we think there was a lot more going on than meets the eye in, in that whole situation. And uh, false flags, et cetera, but also a lot of money changing hands. And um, I, I don't think I've ever gotten a chance to ask you, do you know anything about that story? I can't go into it now because Carrie, because there's just not enough time. But Stephen Paddock was a, he worked for the FBI. He worked directly for Aaron Roos, who was a special agent in charge. They gave him the money to buy those 73 guns (laughs) uh, that they were going to trade to the ISIS. And uh, all it was was a cover-up to try and, and not get everybody to know that the FBI was dealing Gun, uh, trading, uh, trading guns with the ISIS. And uh, right. Stephen Paddock did not die. He did not shoot anybody. <laughs> um, the the right. uh, body camera that they say the guy forgot to turn on when they originally breached the room, that shows three women in there. And, uh, and Paddock was still alive. Uh, I don't know who they put there, who they killed, but it wasn't Stephen Paddock. Very and good. You, you know that... Uh, uh, when the uh, Clark County coroner uh, did the autopsy, the body that they autopsied was three inches shorter than Stephen Paddock. <laughs> now, how more definite could you get of a cover-up than, than that? And, you know, someday we'll go into it, but I got my party now. And All gotta, right. Got to get going. All right. Well, it's, it's really been a joy to have you on as always, uh, John, and we really thank you for coming on the show today on your special day. Uh, everyone does wish you a happy birthday. Uh, do you have to go right away now? Cause I, I want to be fair to you. I know you've got a party starting, uh, but I'm going to also say that there could be some people with questions I haven't thought of uh, that might want to ask you something, or they could maybe write, you know, correspond with you on Facebook whatever you like. Yeah, just have them correspond me on Facebook and I really would stay, Gary, but my family is telling me to get off the phone. All right. We got to get ready for people here or I'd stay. All right. 
happy birthday, John. Stay with us. Stay healthy. Okay. And thank okay. you so much for being with us. Okay. Today. Thank you, Carrie. It's always a pleasure to, to work with you. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, uh, well, that's, uh, that's John Lear on his birthday as uh, honorary and as brilliant and on it and with it as always. And there was quite a few little clues in there for people who attended the screening, the pre premiere last night. I was there. I saw Jimmy Church there. Melinda Leslie was there. Um, Lorian Benton. And I uh, didn't see too many others that we know it all around and about, but a few others, I guess, were there, uh, maybe people I didn't see. And uh, it was an interesting crowd and it, it, there were some interesting uh, energies going on in that building, which is in downtown LA, let me say that. So uh, anyway, thanks for listening today. And uh, it's a very special day. I'm sure you wish John Lear happy birthday and, and be sure to go to his, his Facebook page if you're able to, if you're on Facebook and wish him happy birthday. Um, I hope that Bob Lazar will, will visit him tonight uh, at his birthday and for his birthday. Um, you know, I, I did go to his birthday party last year, but uh, John wanted me to film it, which I did. I made a film for John. It was exclusively for his, his uh, you know, memories. And, uh, but apparently the guests got very offended or at least one or two of them did. I have no idea who they might be, but at any rate, and uh, they didn't trust me. So um, I've never released it. I never will when, you know, I stand by my, my word, but uh, John trusted me and um, still does. Uh, but I can say that uh, they, they said I'm persona non grata at this moment for John's birthday. Uh, I guess because of that. So at any rate, uh, we are here long distance wishing him a very, very happy birthday and many more to come. So thank you for watching and participating here. I am going to have some very interesting guests this week. Um, and I am going to also be, I just found out on Jimmy Church's show on the 11th of December. So if you are a big fan of Jimmy's and I know he has a lot of you out there, then I will be uh, out and about on Jimmy's show. So you can see me next uh, on the 11th. And I think his show is on 7 p.m. Pacific time on, um, let's see, I think the 11th might be a Tuesday. I'm not sure. Anyway, and uh, before that, this week on Thursday night at 7 p.m. Pacific time on my show, I'm going to have a new whistleblower, relatively new, and he has a book out and it is an excellent book and I highly recommend it. His name is Terry Loveless, and he is uh, ex-military. He's a lawyer. He's quite a, uh, a very intelligent guy, really. And he and uh, a fellow, um, I guess, you know, recruit at the time had some very interesting uh, experiences with ETs and uh, very unforgettable, changed his entire life uh, permanently and uh, still still is changing his life, actually. And so we're going to be talking about that. Uh, that is, again, on Thursday night at 7 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, let's see. I think I might be uh, doing a show um, with, let's see, uh, Paul Price, Richard Paul Price or Rick Price, depending on which name you want to use for him. He has his own radio show that's on, like, mainstream radio. And I don't have the call letters, but I will put all this on my site once I have it. And I will be on his show, I think, on the Thursday in the early day. So it'll be around 1 p.m. Pacific time. So that's coming up uh, this week as well. Um, I'm going to be having Deborah uh, Tavares back with me, or Tavares. Uh, and we are going to be talking more about the uh, coming, uh, you know, changes that they're instrumental in in making have happen having to do with earthquakes etc and uh so that has not been scheduled but but please be aware that we that i am planning to have her back and we are planning to do that um i do want to say that there is another show oh robin falkov who is a healer and she is also uh, the partner of richard hoagland is going to be on my show on friday at 1 p.m this week. So that's very exciting. Um, 
I haven't talked to Robin in quite a while. Uh, and so it was really exciting that she accepted my invitation to come on the show. So we're going to catch up with her and see what she's up to. She does do a radio show on her own. And uh, I, I don't have her details here right this minute. They will show up on my website. But again, Robin Balkov, in case you're, you're aware of her, uh, will be on the show on Friday. And um, I have actually invited Richard Hoagland to, to join me on my show. It's not the only time I've invited him. But uh, I don't think I got an answer from him. So I'm still waiting to find out if he's going to ever be willing to come on my show again. Um, some people turn out to be uh, sort of very shy and uh, evasive uh, eventually. Uh, and I think that that's because perhaps they are um, a little worried about some of the things that they, they may say on my show as opposed to other people who don't ask such probing questions, perhaps. At any rate, things are moving along. Uh, disclosure is being helped along, as you can clearly see. Uh, and I do recommend the documentary by uh, Jeremy Corbell. Um, I will invite him on my show if I can manage to get in communication with him. Uh, I think it's very interesting that he was helped along uh, by George Knapp and others, I'm sure, to make this documentary happen. Again, with Bob, with um, Bob Lazar, and uh, th you know, it's got good stuff. It's very supportive of Bob Lazar's story, which I do appreciate. It's a trifle long; uh, probably needs a re-edit, and uh, and could you know use some uh, a, a few more probing questions, I would say. Uh, but uh, we'll see what happens in the future with all of that. Uh, but thanks again for watching and being here today. And please do wish John Lear a happy birthday. Take care and have a great night. Bye-bye.